Hello and namaste. I am your host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeffo. Thanks for joining me for yet another episode of the Almost Daily Zencast. Today's topic, the problem with labels. Let's get started, folks. Labels and the problems that they cause. We love labels. We love them so much that we sacrifice ourselves to identify with them. We eagerly engage in label baiting in our arguments and we accuse each other of being labels irregardless of whether or not we identify. As I write in the introduction there, it's an addiction. It's an ego addiction to that self-identifying relationship with ideological constructs. And this addiction is deadly. I think I've touched on this note before, but it's time to drill down deep. All ideology is mental slavery. Now, that's one of those sentences that people just kind of go, wait, what? All ideology is mental slavery or mental control, if the word slavery is just chapping your hide the wrong way. Mental control, mental oppression. If the word ideology is one that's foreign or distracting somehow to you, you can replace it with labels. All labels are mental slavery or mental occupation or mental oppression or brainwashing. Now, before we get carried away, it has to be noted. This is a sidebar of importance. Um, ancient mystics understood. In fact, we can go in, in terms of known and named mystics of ye old ancient times. We can go uh, as far back as Confucius and see a very clear statement spelling out the following. Some form of mental conditioning or brainwashing is necessary and just and helpful for the young human being growing up through adolescence to um, sort of shed their youthful innocence in a healthy way and become a functioning member of society. Now that being said, Confucius, and even more deeply ancient mystics than that, uh, understood that that was only one-third of the process, or to put it in more two-dimensional terms, one-half of the coin. Once you were coached, guided, taught, educated, or, yes, to be as cynical all the way through the analogy as possible, brainwashed, into being a productive member of your society, you were then supposed to spend X amount of time 
producing for society, following the rules, being a good member, and then initiate in a little bit later on in life, once you sort of like leveled up a bit, matured a bit, gotten some some life experience, you're supposed to then begin to question the societal norms that you were conditioned to adhere to. And this questioning marks the beginning of the end of your phase as a sort of, you know, middle of the bell curve adult that is a contributing member to society. Now, contributing member to society is heavily, heavily jaded, like sandbagged, really screwed up term now with a lot of negative associations, um, or rather negative projections against all those who do not qualify, and is in and of itself a label. Uh, but let's let's proceed here, right? So what happens? You begin to question, and then the the third, the, the final third, the final portion of the the arc, as described by Confucius and and other mystics from previous eras, is that once we've done that and mastered some balance of inner inner health and sanity and participating in our own indoctrination. Because you're not supposed to be indoctrinated to an abusive, unhealthy point. You're supposed to be indoctrinated with the uh, societal norms for the best of the greater good, kind of thing. Kind of that was the expectation being discussed, anyways, from what I understand. And uh, and then you were supposed to strip that away. You were supposed to reach a point in your life when you were secure enough to then abandon the conditioning, the brainwashing, the ideological constructs, and the labels that you needed to put on. We were, okay, to put it a different way, we are born naked, then we have to get coached, taught, talked into wearing clothes, and then eventually there comes a point in our lives where we have to realize, ah, our clothes are not us, we should not be fixated on them, we don't need them really, they're just a handy dandy tool. And then you begin to free yourself of whatever addictions you may have formed during your in, you know, intervening um, period of having a, an attachment to clothes. That was an on-the-fly analogy to explain my other analogy, which is, uh, you know, maybe too many analogies. So... One of the things that our society or our group collective conscious has been tricked into forgetting, into ignoring, is the second and third part of that three-part sequence. In our postmodern society today, we are inundated with brainwashing from the moment we are born. If you're just coming around to realizing that, please, please, please abandon and forgive all the anger that you feel about it. And I'll explain why in depth as we go along. But yeah, it's usually a shock at some point or another. And it seems hopefully, uh, increasingly, more and more people are having these kinds of realizations earlier and earlier in their life. I know that when I first began to question this at the age of nine, I was shunned by all the other nine-year-olds, and I was ridiculed by everyone older than me, whether they were 15 or 20 or 40. Um, Now, I'm not saying I'm special. I just didn't know a lot of people that went, you know, that had reached certain understandings yet. I was not exposed to other folks that, you know, for shorthand, you would call members of my tribe. Now, that's a let's not get caught up in that because we're all one tribe. Uh, so labels, labels, what are they? Why are they necessary? Labels are ancient tools of language. Now, one of the things that we have forgotten is that knowledge 
understanding, comprehension, wisdom, we have forgotten that those things do not exclusively rely on language. We live in a very language-fixated time, and this is not an accident. Language is only one of the many levels of uh, phenomenological comprehension um, or uh, tools. They're just one of the many tools that we have in our mental toolkit for comprehending things, working with others, etc., etc., etc. All the things you think language are critical for, we can use other tools besides language. That seems like a crazy talk right now to some people, but that's because we have been blinded or uh, lied to about our other tools. We've been, we've had our other tools systematically locked away from ourselves. Labels are uh, a sort of core function in language. They're not even a thing. They're a function. Words divide. We understand tree as separate from the forest because we have two words to indicate the two things. But anyone who has ever sat in direct and undistracted communion with uh, natural environments understands and already knows that there is no separation between the forest and the tree. There is no separation between the leaf and the branch and the trunk of the tree. But the words, which we use as labels, create the ideological phenomena of virtual separation. This all occurs in the ego mind. Or rather, it is the ego mind who is actively engaged in using these tools. And it is also the ego mind that has seduced us into thinking that these are the only tools available. So, Why are labels dangerous? Why do I call them an addiction? They, are, they can be useful. When you really need to talk about a thing that's in context with other things, the more specific uh, choice words, the, you know, the more accurate your labels are, the, the more clearly you'll be able to communicate with others. And that's not a bad thing. What... what the what is the bad thing, what has sort of flipped on itself, is that we have excluded or blinded ourselves to other tools available to us, like intuition, like nonverbal body language, like eye contact. Anyone who's really ever been madly, wildly, deeply in love and spent oodles and oodles of time in deep, unwavering eye contact with the person that they love, understands that eye contact can speak volumes. Eye contact alone can communicate endless um, phenomena. Now, is that the most efficient? Of course not. But it, is it more powerful than language? Quite often. But we live in a society that indoctrinates us, that encourages us, that guides us, and that misleads us, dare I say, tricks us into an addiction of labels, which leads to addiction behavior, all kinds of uh, negative uh, behavior arises from this addiction. Label baiting is one of them that I find uh, tragically funny and so sad. I had a conversation today. Maybe that's why I'm on this 
uh, why I picked this uh, theme. So on Facebook, people add me because they see a key phrase in something that I wrote, uh, a response to someone in another thread about something, and they identify a word or two or three, and they relate them to some labels that are loaded with assumptions, and they decide, oh, this other person and I have a lot in common, I'm going to add them. It makes me giggle because sometimes those associations are really way off base based on whatever operational assumptions are going on in those individuals' minds. I'm not criticizing them. I'm not spewing hate at them. I just think it's fascinating. Um, I'll connect these whole, all this together. Today I was scrolling through um, the Facebook land and I saw a post. I needed to respond to it because it called me. And it was someone I didn't know very well, someone that I'm fairly certain must have added me, not the other way around, because I don't, the name doesn't ring a bell, and I went and looked at their profile, nothing there, I was like, oh, I met them somewhere, or, or, they, or I was inspired by something they wrote. Not the kind of person I would do that with, from what I can see on the surface of their profile. I'm not trying to be rude, just the facts. And they posted um, with, the palm, with the palm fronds background, I don't know if you guys have seen that, it conveys a very bizarre connotation to whatever you put in between it. It's like blue skies, like you're looking at a beach, but you know, it's a little, it's a little cartoon graphic. And it's got two palm tree frond heads, you know. The content, the word content is privatize all of the things. Now this is something I see people praising all the time. Privatization. Privatization is going to save our passes from the overreach of horrible government. Now, the following conversation I'm going to give you the highlights on is based on an assumption I made and an assumption he made. Uh, now, the, the person posting here, I got nothing against them. I'm no beef with them. I'm not, I'm not calling them out. I'm here to, it just goes along with the theme of labels. Uh, I, I, I was apparently the first person to respond, and I wrote back, privatization is the is NWO code, is New World Order code, uh, code word for profiteering. And Right, so they conflated, uh, I was, I'm anti-capitalism, and I'm anti a lot of things, and I'm anti the Fed. And these, this individual and someone who's there, uh, they're clearly capitalist fans, capitalism fans. And they, exp uh, they define it, just as the propagandists train you to, as the freedom of the individual to own private property and trade for profit at the free market. And of course, capitalists hate big government because big government impinges on the free market. And what I was trying to point out to them is that the whole thing is jerry-rigged So I get asked by the originator of the post, which is it? Are you anti-New World Order? Are you anti-capitalist? Pick one, implying that you can't be both. So we got into this particular interesting thing, and my response was to go, I think you're trying to pigeonhole me into a, a label. And I'm trying to share with you that I am against all of those labels. So to try to express that, um, I said, none of these labels accurately describe what I actually am. To put it as simply as possible, I am anti-everything that is an ideological construct. I made some memes to make it easy to understand. Politics, religion, society are all ideology. Economics, patriotism, elitism, ideology. Ideology is mental slavery. We talk about that a lot on the show. 
I believe in no form of ism of any kind. I reject all ideology. Having done this, I see reality much more clearly now compared to how I was seeing it before. So, with a sense of humor, he replied, crypto-Marxist, my bad. I had to reply, nope. That's just you being stubborn and insisting on calling me some label that helps you feel like you've put me in my place. I subscribe to zero isms or ideologies of any kind. If it has a label that ends with ism or ist or ology, I reject it and not, uh, I try not to adhere to it. I adhere to none of its components. It comes back that you're a leftist by default, period. No amount of sophistry will change that. Uh, and we went on talking about these points, and I kept trying to say, that uh, my position is both against the capitalists and the New World Order because I don't think that they're separate. Um, I'm against uh, corrupt government as it exists today, and I don't support those that claim that they're out to destroy government vis-a-vis getting elected into government. Um, keeps thinking that I'm a leftist. I'm distracted because he kept trying to insult leftists vis-a-vis -vis insulting me. Uh, government is just a punching bag puppet for the corporations that are trying to tear down government. They are inseparable, and the whole scam is make-believe. I had to point out to him, I think he thinks that the government isn't already owned by the very corporations that are wanting to privatize everything. Now, he may have scored some interesting ideological points that may have shown that he uh, has a great grasp of all these different labels. But he refused to accept and understand and try to explore my point that I am encouraging us to communicate outside of all the labels. I wasn't trying to argue with him. I'm just saying that privatization ain't no good for nobody. Just like hyper-governmentization ain't no good for nobody. Oh, I should say that to him right now. No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can voice text, voice to text. Oh, now I've totally lost the page. Where'd it go? Uh, oh, there we go. Ah. Not on the surface it doesn't, comma. The thing is, governmentization and privatization are two ends of the same pole, exclamation point. That's what I'm trying to communicate, comma, that you're categorically not allowing yourself to receive the communication of because you're busy trying to pigeonhole me in a label that will then give you a name to call me, which will allow you to dismiss my point, period. Privatization only virtually appears to be the opposite of governmentization, period. I say that that is a virtual and false opposition, comma, because government and corporations are all owned and controlled by the same small group of people that are profiteering, I don't mean making a little bit of money enough to like pay their needs and then have some to give to their kids left over. I mean hoarding billions at the expense 
of other people dying! Exclamation point. Are you familiar with the idea of good cop versus bad cop? Question mark. That's what's going on with the bullshit fight between privatization and governmentization, period. Both of those ideological constructs are artificial, first of all, period. And they are artificially pitted against each other by the same people who controlled the two constructs in order to keep the masses distracted and arguing and fighting and easy to oppress and abuse and inculcate into endless war which the profiteers make absurd amounts of money, unnecessary amounts of money, which is a violation of everyone else's human right to live in peace in the pursuit of happiness. Ooh, that little someone is typing thing is already busy twirling away. So I'm sure he's, like, knee-jerk jumped on whatever, like, trigger words his particular ideological label has trained him to believe indicate this other ideological label is attacking his beliefs. We'll see what he says in a minute if he gets in a comment on that. I got 18 minutes left. Now, this isn't about being more right than him. I concede that, uh, you know, plenty of people understand Marxism better than I do. Plenty of people understand the nuances of free market propaganda better than I do. But my point is, both of those things are propaganda. Whether it's free market, is oh, I think he called me a communist at one point. Um, and, like, none of those labels make any sense to me in terms of what I'm saying. This is the problem with labels. If you're really, and let's not worry about him anymore, this particular individual, God bless it, I'm not trying to antagonize him. But let's, let's, let's broaden it out. If we, I don't want to get too pejorative sounding, if we, if I, to make the example all about me and not about you, so it's less threatening, if I were to get so caught up in my label as a Buddhist, which I don't, which I don't carry. I don't call myself a Buddhist, except for like on dating sites, because that's the easiest way to indicate sort of what I mean. Because I'm not a Buddhist. I don't belong. I don't go to any Buddhist churches or, or uh, temples. I don't. I, I, I never paid anyone to to put my name in a book for a Buddhist school of anything. I don't. You know, I've never gone to a Buddhist. Uh, retreat led by X so and so in an orange uh, sarong. You know, I just don't have it. I've done my research, I've done my reading, and I've done my direct phenomenological experimentation with meditation. And I am convinced that we do, like it says in Fight Club, uh, you know, you're not your bank account, you're not your political party, you're not your khaki pants, you're not the car you drive, you're not the couch you bought, the, the things you buy end up owning you, right? Well, the ideological labels you buy end up owning you. And this, my friends, prevents any real, genuine communication and collaboration on the solution to the actual problems that we face. Because if you're looking at the world and its problems through a really specific ideological filter, then you're seeing a different problem than everybody else is seeing. Because that's what ideological filters do. Thus, ultimately, almost every conversation that I have with anybody ever about ideologies or political parties or things that people believe in, it ultimately boils down to this statement. Ideology is mental slavery. If you want to liberate yourself from that mental slavery, you need to look within because that is where the revolution happens. You can't go over there to that city and kill those men and women to free yourself from the ideology that you cling to in your mind. 
Look within is where the revolution must begin, looking within. Not trying to wrap that, but kind of came out like I was putting on my rapper jams, which I, wow, totally fell apart. Cool, good. Um, I'm not trying to front anything, I'm not. So yeah, um, you see like, and I get it, so because I said NWO and and something about the Fed, then I'm some kind of neocon or whatever, you know. Or because I said, you know, I've been accused of being everything. I've been accused of being a, 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 a right-wing Christian. I've been accused of being um, some sort of uh, corrupted liberal Christian. I've been accused of being a Muslim. I've been accused of being... Uh, I've been accused of being a Zionist Jew. I've been accused of... And my whole jam, folks, is going, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's just let go of all the labels. Let's really abdicate them. It's tough. It's really hard because ego loves labels. Ego loves jamming pegs into square holes. Because once they pe jam that peg in, even if it's only in like the oomph of a centimeter in, it's stuck there. Stuck in there real good, isn't it? You ever jam a round peg into a square hole? It either won't go in, won't go in, won't go in, or then come just a tiny bit, like mm, just the edge of the thing is in. Then you can't get it out. Like it's stuck. You got to really fucking whack it to like shake it loose again. I'm reminded of the saying in the New Testament, something about you can't, you can't help remove the mote in your brother's eye or the splinter in your brother's eye until, have, until you have removed the beam from your own. Uh, I don't pretend to be a biblical translator, but let's try to, let's try to uh, kind of put a more contemporary phrasing on. I can't liberate that guy from his ideologies. I can only liberate myself from my own and then show him what that's like or talk about it, share about it. Uh, so I'm, as you'll note, that in my responses, I was trying to tell him anything other than to say, excuse me, I think you're projecting, which isn't, you know, I could be wrong, but it, that's what it feels like. That's what, certainly what it appears like. You're calling me labels, and I don't belong to those labels. And those are one of the hardest conversations to have. It's really had, hard to have a conversation when someone's like, you're this kind of label. And I'm like, no. Oh, well, then you're this kind of label that's just like it. No, I really am not. Well, you are. But, but I'm over here telling you what I understand from the inside of my head. I know I'm not. I'm not an anarchist. You get called an anarchist all the time. Uh, I'm not a statist. There's just some things about the organization of activities at a community level, at a county level, at a statewide level, and at a continent-wide level. Continent-wide level. Because let's face it, this country's a whole fucking continent unto itself almost. Not quite. The only one that really nails that is Australia. But uh, although most of the world wants to pejoratize that, they're just a really big island. They're not a whole continent. But yeah, they, they, they got that whole continent unto yourself thing. Uh, but the, the United States of America gets really close. So when I engage with these folks, it's just to point out that this is possible. I'm not there to uh, accuse their particular ism that they're clinging to of anything, really, except to point out the facts that I understand as I understand them. And then to try to have a conversation about facts and see if his, their understanding, my understanding can find a place of connection. But ultimately, I'm really just there to stand as evidence that a person can self-identify as non-label as opposed to our, you know, struggling and fighting to find a label to identify as. And also to, to give the testimony 
the, the less I attach to labels, the better I feel, the healthier I feel, and the more clear I, I perceive myself and those around me and the universe. That doesn't make me special. I'm just saying it's, it's certainly less stressful and it seems to be more, much more joy involved uh, in, in being free of these labels that pit you against others. And that's something that's lost. Uh, they don't see it. When they're defending their ism and trying to peg you for what ism you are, they, they, whoever they may be, typically are not aware that that is a function, uh, a really direct result of us versus them brainwash. My ism is the best ism. My political, I think I've already gone off on this rant in another segment, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, so that was really interesting and I thought it really valuable to talk about that for a second. I find that uh, there is something that helps me. It's daunting task, right? The very idea. Uh, how do you abdicate all your labels? You know, because we sort of love labels. Um, someone was talking. Another uh, Facebook acquaintance had posted something that is. It's one of those. It's one of those. Um, where did it go? Where did it go? I'm trying, oh wait, I'm trying to get in the habit of here we go. Going to my save. I'm trying to get in the habit of saving these posts in my saved section so I can find them quicker. So I have a totally different Facebook acquaintance. Myra, M A capital Y R A. And she spells out a beautiful thing. I don't know where she got it from. I know I've seen this before, and it's true, and it's real, and it's magical. And I love her. She gives her own words to it. Um, this is one of the most simple, direct, organic, true, and undebunkable and really powerful organic spiritual mantras or prayers or magic spells, whatever label you like, because right, we're not about labels. Um, that really, 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 really works. And I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of spells, there's a lot of uh, schools out there teaching you all these ancient things and stuff. One of the things the ancients really understood was that all of this is organic. All of this is natural. And so while fancy words and highfalutin rituals don't hurt because sometimes it's, it's good to heighten the, the focusing of consciousness through ritual, through a little dash of drama, through a flare of color and pomp and circumstance. But that's why, uh, even in mystic times, we developed cultural memes, back before we had visual memes, we developed cultural memes, which we call rituals. This is as old as it gets, folks. And then I'm gonna read it, because I love her, Emily, I have five minutes left. I love the words she adds to it. And it was just a random post, she wasn't responding to anybody, but it's so applicable to so many things. One, I am sorry. Two, please forgive me. Three, I thank you. Four, I love you very much. Now, the cynical voice in us all, the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time that this is exposed to us. We'll need your fucking kick around. That's so lame. Only fucking weak people say that kind of shit. This is this won't solve anything. You know, you know they're not worthy of forgiveness. 
set all that aside. This is, of course, a sort of postmodern version of Hopu Opno, which I don't think I pronounced correctly. Um, for those who want to look that up, it's spelled H O apostrophe O P O N O P O N O. And it's a particular culture's ancient mystic tradition, Hopu Opuno, which is something you say to someone else. Um, she points out that this postmodern version, you can do it to yourself. You don't need anyone else to be there. You don't need anyone else to hear you. You can say the words in your head, the power and the feeling and the willingness. Uh, yeah, the power is in the feeling and in the willingness of the universe to forgive and love. And that's absolutely true. I want to interject, though, and add my own thoughts here, and that's that it is a wonderful thing to do this with others. This should be the first thing that any couples coach teaches all couples that are, you know, going through difficult times. Because eye contact with this mantra, with these mantras, with this spell, unlocks some deep compassion and some deep empathy. That's what eye contact is for, folks. Okay. So, step one, repeat that I am sorry. Yeah, you can you can say the whole list over and over again in a cyclical repetition, or you can sit in each step for X amount of time. I recommend you do both. Um, if I were going to write a recipe for how to do this, like over a timeline, I would say sit down, get yourself centered, be quiet for one minute, and then say the four things as a list in a row over and over again, over and over again for a minute, and then sit with each individual one for two minutes and say, I am sorry, over and over and over and over again as many times, as genuinely, as heartfeltedly, as actively as you can muster. Better yet, with your life partner, with your sibling, with your anybody in your life that you want to share this magic with, do it, eye contact. Even better, Holding hands and eye contact. Um, so forgive me, I'm totally interjecting all over her thing, and I'm running out of time. So I'm going to get a little bit more focused. As uh, she goes on to say, as I mentioned above, you are responsible for everything in your mind, even if it seems to be out there. That is some hardcore truth, folks. Once you realize that it's very natural to feel sorry, uh... Once you realize that, it is very natural to feel sorry. And she says, I'm, I know I sure I do. I am sure I do. If I feel a, a, a fear of a tornado, I am so full of remorse that something in my consciousness has created that idea. I am so very sorry that someone I know has broken a bone and I realize that I have caused it. It's an extended uh, bit of causality there, but it's not, not fake. I mean, it's not, it isn't uh, crazy. This realization can be painful, and you will likely resist accepting responsibility for the out there kinds of problems until you start to practice this method on more obvious in here kinds of problems and see results. She makes an excellent point. Ancient, ancient teaching, as above, so below. As within, so without. Those are not opposites. Those are relationships, folks. All right, I'm running out of time. I wish I had started reading her thing a bit earlier because the rest of the steps are really awesome. But I've got it bookmarked and I'm going to make a special... I'll, I'll be sure to revisit it. So um, you, get this, you get the notion of how that works. Uh, give it a try. Even with what little bits I've just expressed, give it a try and uh, see what happens. <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. May peace, love, and grooviness fill your heart, and may you find your path to self-liberation from your own mind and the ideological constructs we've been slaved to. out.